questions and hopefully give some good answers about the COVID-19 vaccines that are available right now. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our panel, and then we can get started on the discussion. Uh, first, we have Dr. Darian Sutton. Dr. Sutton is an emergency room physician and ABC News medical contributor. Kelly Bryan is a nurse and executive director of the Simulation Center and an assistant professor at Columbia University. Rachel Busman, Dr. Rachel Busman is a board certified child and adolescent psychologist. Isabel Ching is executive director at Hamilton Madison House and Eyewitness News reporter Kimberly Richardson, uh, my friend and colleague who is here to share her personal story of an allergic reaction that she had after getting her first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So let's jump in, you guys. Um, first, obviously, the news of the day, the news of the week is all about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the pause that is now taking place here in the United States as well as in Europe. Um, just very, very important for anyone listening right now. We have to stick with the numbers here. Right now, less than one in a million chance of this rare clotting event um, and almost 7 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine given here in the United States. So incredibly rare. Dr. Sutton, Darian, we're friends. I'm going to call everyone by their first names uh, today. But, uh, you know, there's a saying in medicine, an increased risk of a rare event is still a rare event. What's your assessment of the Johnson & Johnson pause right now? Well, thank you, Dr. Jen. I think it, exactly that. What is rare will likely stay rare. But I think what's most important is that this pause that has been recommended by the CDC is really the main point is to develop a central guideline for us clinicians to be able to handle the questions and to examine and treat patients appropriately when they come in with complaints. And it's out of a, a, an abundance of caution. And I think that that is appropriate. It shows that the CDC and the overall regulations and guidelines are being transparent so that everyone knows what is going on and and then we can move forward. Um, I've got a lot of hope and a lot of belief that this will this will this will pan out to hopefully producing positive benefits where we'll still be able to get people who want to get vaccinated the vaccines that they desperately need. I, I agree. And I think also, um, and I want to bring in Dr. Busman, Rachel, in a second to talk about the fear and anxiety that this headline has generated. But you know, I really took this as a reassuring sign that our public health system is working. Um, you know, I would be much more anxious, much more concerned if we didn't hear any oversight, any pause, any evaluation of the data. Um, and I think it should be a reminder to people that safety corners will not be cut here, even as there is so much urgency to get these vaccines out. But um, Rachel, what is your... What's your approach when you deal with someone who hears the headline and is still having a hard time going with the numbers, the, the very rare likelihood that this would affect them? Sure. It's such a good question. And again, thank you for having me. I think when we're, everybody's sort of in a heightened state of anxiety and has been for the past year. But I think I go back to what Dr. Darren is saying is that, you know, we have numbers. We want to honor our anxiety and listen to it, but also remind ourselves that that we can go kind of zero to 60 really quickly, and that's an emotional reaction. But then we want to look to the numbers, look to what the data tells us. And I couldn't agree with you more that there's this transparency, which can make us nervous because we're given information, but at the same time, we're being given information so we understand the process and that it's clear. So we should should notice the anxiety, but then look to the numbers and the data. And also just to wrap up the Johnson & Johnson headline before we start going to our incredible questions, um, I think it's really important for people hearing about this pause to understand that it's not just less than one in a million risk of this clotting event. It's what's the risk of the vaccine? What's the risk of not getting the vaccine and the risk of getting COVID or long haul post-COVID syndrome or dying of COVID? What's the benefit of the vaccine? We've heard about the efficacy. What's the benefit of not getting the vaccine? You know, that will give you the smallest number here. Um, really, there is no benefit of not getting the vaccine at this point. So those four questions, I think, will help uh, lead people to the right answer. So let's jump into the first question. It comes from Terry in Demarest, New Jersey. And Terry asks, there's been some talk about possibility needing a booster for the vaccine. If you received a Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 
will the booster have to be from Johnson & Johnson also if you are now uncomfortable with the issues potentially of the J&J &J vaccine? Will you be able to receive a booster from Pfizer or Moderna, even though those vaccines work differently? This is an excellent question. Um, Kelly, why don't you jump in and then uh, Darian, uh, let's hear your take on this. Sure. It, there is a feeling that eventually we all will probably need boosters. There's variants that are out there and we'll need those uh, boosters to protect us from these new variants. However, the question about whether it's going to come from Pfizer, Moderna, I think there's a lot of it we don't know yet. They're currently testing these boosters. And so I think, and unless Dr. Uh, Darian has something to add, uh, I'm not sure if we have the answers quite yet to, to all of these questions regarding boosters. Exactly that. I like to qualify this as what we call evolving data. And so right now, as time goes on, we get more information regarding the longevity of the current vaccines that are in play right now. And as we will see in the months to come, um, we will look at the data and see if patients are becoming infected who have gotten the vaccine to try to test if that efficacy or that effectiveness in real life is possibly waning. So that's a question that we have yet to answer. Um, to answer the second part, which I think I agree, it's an excellent question. Um, there's no reason to believe that if one were to get one type of vaccine and require an additional booster, that that booster would need to be the same. And I'm going off of information that we have from different types of vaccines. For example, the flu vaccine, many people may not know that there are different types and there's no um, clear indication or guidelines regarding the fact that you would have to get the same type of vaccine if you would need to get it. But again, we're still waiting for more information data. Yep, absolutely evolving in real time. Uh, second question comes from Roseanne in Union, New Jersey. Roseanne asks, I've recently received my first dose of the Pfizer vaccine approximately two hours after the shot. I developed mild facial flushing, which lasted about two hours. I did not have any other symptoms. Does this qualify as an adverse reaction to the vaccine or is it a normal side effect? And do I need to worry about receiving the second dose? Darren, uh, your emergency medicine, what do you say to this question? I'd say the first part is that I wouldn't qualify that as an adverse reaction. There's uh, common reactions that happen after vaccinations in general, and that can include skin changes, flushing, and usually this is all associated to our normal immune response re responding to that vaccine. And so that specific incident, I would not qualify. And I would not use that as reasons that you shouldn't get the second vaccine. I would just keep a hopeful eye out um, and, and make sure that if you were to develop any symptoms after that vaccine, that we treat them accordingly. But again, I wouldn't qualify that as an adverse reaction. It's likely just a, an immune reaction secondary to the fact that you got the vaccine. Well, Kimberly, this is a perfect segue into you <laughs> sharing your story. You and I were texting um, why don't you uh, share with us, if you can and will, what happened to you after your vaccine? Yes, after my vaccine. Hi, everybody. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to share this um, in this format with, with experts um, and not too much on social media when it was happening, because that can be kind of scary. And if you see the pictures, we don't, we don't want to uh, freak people out. Uh, I preface all of this with saying I've always been a very highly allergic person since I was a little girl. So I've always had occasional hives or Benadryl I need or Allegra, two trips to the emergency room where it got a little scary. So with that said, knowing I was heading into the, the vaccine process, number one, I, I wanted to make sure I did it in the hospital just in case I, I did have some reactions. I carry an EpiPen and uh, D Dr. Jen was terrific. I remember when you were getting ready for your vaccine, you said you premedicated and I said, I'll do that. And of course I didn't do that. <laughs> um, so I had my first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, March 15th. Um, next couple of days, pretty typical symptoms, you know, headache, a little tired. Dave, and then everything went away. Then day five, I had a little hives, a little itching, which again, for me, it could be anything. It went away that day. The next day it came, day six, and it was bigger and more aggressive, hives and itching. And it would continue for eight or nine days after. Um, it would appear in different parts of my body. Um, I immediately text Dr. Jen, help. Um, <laughs> it, I eventually did tell a visit with doctors and they... I had tried Allegra and, and Benadryl and Benadryl spray, and it was kind of working, but not really. I was eventually put on a low-dose steroid, and eventually after eight or nine days, it calmed down. Because I hadn't heard of that, that's what really got me worried. I don't know what this is. I don't know. So that's why I wanted to share it with folks in case they, too, have had a similar reaction. 
Um, I was very reluctant going into uh, dose two now. What should I do? Do I not take it? The next dose was April 5th. Um, this time I did pre-medicate. Uh, four days before the um, vaccine, I started taking a, a good amount of Allegra. And so far, so good. It was last Monday. Um, I was very nervous, but went into it. And to date, not any itchies, no health, no hives, no welts or anything. So it was uncomfortable. It was it was scary at the time because again, I hadn't heard of this. I've heard of other side effects. So you guys, please, um, mm -hmm. you're the experts. You know, if you want to jump in and let people can know I, what I want. Can I, can I add something just from the anxiety piece? I can't speak to to any of these reactions. Although I'm curious if someone who's had a history of having allergic reactions or a heightened reaction, my guess makes me vulnerable. But what I really like about sharing the story, one is that it's just open. We Just during this time, having open dialogue is so helpful. But I've heard a lot of people in my practice um, in psychology worried about the second vaccine. I've heard all this stuff, right? And some of it is, yes, people have had any number of symptoms, some common and some less common, but just that you reached out, you got information, you shared what you were experiencing, then you planned ahead for the second vaccine by pre-medicating with what was prescribed. But again, there was an openness. And even though you were anxious, which is totally normal, you did what was right and medically sound and made a really good and informed decision and then texted with people and got support. So that's really important, I think, to to do things that are hard, even though we're nervous. And, and also, Rachel, wouldn't you say, just from a psychological standpoint, that taking those steps is a way to demonstrate some degree of control over a situation that can oftentimes feel out of control? A hundred percent. I think during this time, especially the whole pandemic, not just vac vaccines, we've really felt very much out of control. And then sometimes we try to exercise efforts to control things that are with outside of our control. So taking steps towards something that you actually can control gives you a sense of agency. It actually is really great to model for our kids. They see us doing things that are reasonable, taking action, doing something that's in your control. Talk to your doctor, say, I, I can be a kind of highly allergic person. What can I do to set myself up for the next step and not be afraid because you haven't heard of a reaction, but saying, this isn't this isn't normal. I want to get more information and then reaching out to the medical professionals. And also, before we go on to the next question, I just want to wrap up this issue. Kimberly and I were talking about this um, offline because initially, when these vaccines were uh, were authorized, um, you know, I'm sure Darian, you saw this a lot in the ER. But um, the big concern, the fear, the possibility, which had been seen in some clinical trials and then in Europe, because they were a little bit ahead of us, was the rare severe allergic reaction or anaphylactic reaction. Again, to share my story, um, as many, many people know, because I talked about it on national television, I carry an EpiPen. I've had an anaphylactic reaction. Um, at the time where I got my first dose, uh, which was in December, there was a cited risk of one in 90,000 of having an allergic or a severe allergic reaction, an anaphylactic reaction. I had my EpiPens. I had spoken to my allergist who recommended not pre-medication with Benadryl, but just like Kimberly did with an over-the-counter antihistamine like Claritin or Zyrtec. I did that and I stuck with the numbers. I said, my risk of COVID is significantly higher than one in 90,000. I will take my chances um, and go ahead and get this vaccine. So I hope that can help people stratify their risk. Um, Kimberly, thank you for sharing your story and just how you walked through it and how you coped with it, both physically and psychologically. I think that's so important. Um, and now you're vaccinated, so congrats. And can I just add one thing also, someone that's giving Yeah, Kelly. Vaccines? Please, when you go to get your vaccine, let the person know that you have a history of anaphylactic reaction because that's very important because then we're going to take that extra time and watch you for 30 minutes to make sure that you don't have a reaction because most people that have that reaction are going to have it within that first 30 minutes. So I just want to you know, yes. that important. Excellent point, Kelly. Um, all right, let's. we have a great question here from Helen in Oceanside. Helen says, I'm 66 years old with underlying conditions. I'm fully vaccinated. When I visit my three school-aged grandchildren, should I be wearing a mask 
or should they? Great question. Who wants to take this one? I think I, I can, I, I'll be, I'll take it as I have two grandmothers right now who are vaccinated <laughs> <laughs> and want desperately to hug me. But I will say that even though I am vaccinated and they are vaccinated, I do know that I have a higher level of risk given the fact that I'm seeing patients every day who have symptomatic COVID. So I still give them the hugs that they want, but I do wear a mask. And that is my personal way of keeping that basic layer of protection because I have the understanding that vaccines, although are incredibly effective right now, are not 100%. And so I think that, yes, you can share rooms and hugs and laughter, but I also think that if you feel comfortable, um, it is okay to wear a mask um, to help that with that extra layer of protection. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think especially now that we're getting into warmer months and it, it's more possible to visit with people in an outdoor environment, which is safer and keep a little more distance, really the more layers or buffers of protection, especially against the more vulnerable um, like grandparents or someone with a chronic medical condition, the better. Um, no one will fault anyone for that. Um, next question, Rose in Queens. Rose says, we've been avoiding eating in restaurants. Now that we are fully vaccinated, can we eat indoors or do we still need to stay away due to the variants out there? Um, Isabel, I know that, that you're not a physician or a nurse, but you're really in an area where socializing um, and restaurants here in New York City are a big deal. What what are you seeing? And then we'll we'll take the kind of medical answer. Sure, and thank you, uh, Kimberly, for sharing that. Um, and I know that people probably have had uh, adverse reactions, but I think there are many people who have had actually no reactions, maybe a sore arm. Um, that's just by experience and observation. That's not a, not a medical uh, thing. But yeah, um, you know, we're a settlement house um, primarily in North Manhattan and Chinatown. Uh, we've helped and assisted about over a thousand seniors and restaurant workers to get vaccinated. And we're talking, um, uh, we, uh, Dr. Rachel was talking about anxiety. This is what we're trying to do is help people not to be so anxious. So the anxiety is already, how do I get an appointment? Where do I find an appointment? How do I get a reservation? Uh, um, and also the language. Uh, so we provide bilingual uh, language with helping the process. And then also to do the second vaccination. That's so critical because it's just not the first time, but doing the second vaccination, making sure that our clients are coming back to um, and our members, our seniors, our children, our restaurant workers, uh, just making that double uh, phone call and encouraging and confirming those appointments are really critical. And we're hoping that Chinatowns, it, they're, actually it's, uh, it's booing people coming back to Chinatown eating and it's safe. I've been in Chinatown a few times and I've um, done my precautions, wear my mask, if, double mask if I have to, but um, I think it's pretty safe. I've been out in this community working since the pandemic, um, and we've been taking really uh, um, precautions and just making sure that we wash our hands and still wear our masks even though we are vaccinated. And Isabel, are you seeing people go to restaurants more in Chinatown? You know, in the very er uh, early, it was just really very dismal. Lots of places were closed. I have seen since the uh, weather has been, um, you know, uh, better, more and more people have come and visit. So it's really nice to see uh, Chinatown becoming, uh, it hasn't been to that point because if you observe this, there are many restaurants that have closed due to uh, COVID, but we're trying down here uh, and trying to help the restaurants um, get their loans and help them with getting their uh, staff uh, vaccinated. And for Rose, um, who says, you know, can can we eat indoors or do we still need to stay away due to the variants? I think to echo something, uh, Darian, that you said earlier, um, you know, these vaccines are highly effective against preventing hospitalizations and deaths, um, in many cases, 100 percent, but they are not 100 percent in preventing infections. So um, I will only say that personally, <laughs> as someone who's been vaccinated and as a physician, I'm still not really comfortable eating at an indoor restaurant location. Um, I, I definitely want to support the restaurants. In Starting on Monday in New York City, restaurants will be open until midnight. Um, so they're, they're loosening up and reopening a little bit. But, you know, I'll take out, I'll order in, or I'll sit outside. But I think right now we still have to be careful. Um, Darian, do you agree with that? 
I agree. Um, before I step into any establishment, I ask myself a couple of questions. Is it crowded? Are people wearing masks? Is there good ventilation? Um, I ask these questions whenever I'm, I'm going around in my own community, and that is for even the grocery store versus a library versus the dry cleaner. And so I think the same. I think a restaurant, for me personally, an indoor establishment, is a little bit more of a higher level of risk than I feel comfortable with. But again, I think there are other ways to uh, eat with friends in safe ways. And right now, I would probably steer toward that. I agree with you. Yeah, um, I, Rachel, I before we leave that yeah. the question, can you just speak to um, something that we're starting to hear more about as certain cities and states reopen? Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people who had baseline general or social anxiety before the pandemic, especially teenagers, which is your wheelhouse. And actually part of the pandemic has almost worked well for people with that type of anxiety. Now that yep. we're reopening, um, it's kind of stacking the deck for their anxiety. What are your tips for people who may be feeling nervous about that? I'm so glad you brought that up. You're right. My area is child and adolescent anxiety. So this is definitely on my mind. And I think you're right. I've talked to a lot of patients who have some really good insight into saying the pandemic has been helpful sometimes because I'm in my comfort zone at home um, where I don't need to, let's say, be around a whole lot of people where I might feel like people are judging me or, or, or I feel a lot of social pressure or anxiety. So you're absolutely right that when we, my metaphor is usually when we practice anything, we get good at it. So if you practice staying away from things, you also get good at staying away from them, right? Now, before we were staying away because we needed to stay at home. But I think as things open up, we want to be mindful that even for adults, but for teens and kids with anxiety, stepping back into the quote real world is hard. And so we want to give small and incremental practice. So maybe you set up for your child or teen a, a short or brief kind of structured interaction or a small gathering, you know, or something socially distant, but maybe with a very comfortable person for them so that they can incrementally practice kind of being back outside, being around other people, right? We call that exposure. And so we wanna do that, not exposure to the illness, but exposure to feared situations. So we wanna give a lot of practice getting back out there. Um, and I think being compassionate with ourselves as, let's say, parents or with our kids, that this is hard to do hard things. And so we're going to need a little bit of practice and, and patience as we do it. But little steps that you can repeat are excellent. And Rachel, just um, before we move on to the next question, to stay on that issue of nervousness or anxiety and practicing something, um, talk about practicing. We all have to get used to practicing a new almost language of social interaction, right? So what tips do you have for people if, let's say, I invite you over and you're not comfortable, what kind of language should I be using to make you feel more at ease? I'm, we're, you're asking all the really good questions. I think this has been challenging for us, right? I know I experience this in my own family, but even just working with families where different people have different levels of comfort, right? And I think just being, it, it take, it's a little bit of a leap of faith to manage our own anxiety to say, oh, I want to say something that might feel uncomfortable to me, but it's probably the right thing. So I might say, Kelly, I know you invited me over for a picnic in your backyard. I just want to understand what it's going to be like. Or if I'm having someone over, we're having a picnic on the backyard. I just want you to know what can I do to help you feel comfortable or what information would be helpful to have. I think most people would feel very relieved to hear that and say, oh, I'm so glad you're saying that. And if someone's feathers are ruffled a little bit, that's also okay to say, oh, well, like, Kelly, I, I just want to let you know how I will feel comfortable and you let me know how you will feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And But that is scary for people to do that because it's putting yourself in a place that's vulnerable, but it's also really good to do it. And it's great for our kids to see us navigating social relationships in a really appropriate way. Absolutely, and a whole new language for us all to learn. Um, Darian, first part of this question for you, second part for you, Kelly. Um, Abby from New York City asks, once you've been vaccinated, should people continue to get regular COVID tests, either rapid or PCR, uh, to help, I assume for surveillance purposes, to help officials monitor infection rates or identify spread of new variants? 
or would being vaccinated skew the city's results? So Darian, why don't you take that? And Kelly, after Darian answers that, I'd like to know what you're seeing up at Columbia in terms of surveillance or screening tests. That's a great question. Um, for currently, well, first I have to state that after you've completed your vaccination, that is the two doses of the mRNA vaccine or the one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it should be with or beyond two weeks and to, for you to qualify yourself as immunized to hopefully obtain that effectiveness that we are seeing right now in real world situations. I do not think that those who have been fully immunized and completed their vaccinations need to do uh, routine screenings unless they are symptomatic. Uh, right now, what we have given, been given from the CDC is that those who have been exposed, if they are fully immunized and completed their vaccination and they do not have symptoms, they don't have to get tested and they don't have to quarantine. Again, if you develop symptoms, that's a different situation where you should get tested. Dr. Darius, can I jump in? For, uh, I was going to yeah. ask that same question, Dr. <laughs> Jen. So given my line of work, very, uh, you know, in the public, I'm um, interacting with the public. I was going to ask that same question. i for months get tested every week um, because I was around my 80 year old mom and my niece and nephew who are both 14 and 10. So this was before my mom was vaccinated. I'm now as of this coming Monday will be fully vaccinated. My mom is, my sister is, but the two little ones aren't. Do I keep getting tested every Friday just to make sure even if I have no symptoms? Uh, you know, I think the answer to that, um, Kimberly, is, and I also just just here at ABC, um, I am still tested weekly. That's not my decision. That's a company policy. And I think the possible benefits for that type of surveillance or screening um, are numerous. Number one, to emphasize this point again, the vaccines are not 100% effective at preventing infection, um, especially asymptomatic infection. So to add another layer, another buffer of protection, security, surveillance, screening, I think is a good thing, especially now that testing um, is much more accessible, much more widespread. However, on the flip side, remember, um, this is what Darian and I, and, and probably Kelly as well, have to deal with on a regular basis with our patients, um, there are and can be false positives with any test. So I have a saying that I think is critically important in medicine. You shouldn't do a test unless you know what you'll do with the results of that test. And so if you're getting surveillance or screening testing on a regular basis and you get a positive, A, that means like it or not, vaccinated or not, you need to quarantine until you can get other confirmatory tests, assuming you have no symptoms. Um, and I, so I, I think that at this point, with the variants, with the fact that these vaccines are not 100% effective at preventing asymptomatic infection, that you always want to err on the side of caution. And as we heard Dr. Anthony Fauci say months ago, you want to do more, not less. Um, Kelly, any thoughts on that? No, I, I agree with everything you said, Dr. Jen. And here at Columbia, yes, we do have surveillance program in place also. So you're going to get an email and it'll say you have to get your test. And we have found that some people who have no symptoms, like you said, come up positive. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting testing. And we also have it where you can get tested at any time that you want to. Uh, because again, the vaccines aren't 100%. And if you have any signs or symptoms, it's safer just to go get tested. I agree. Um, so this is a good one from Florence in Brooklyn. She asks, after getting vaccinated, should I get the antibody blood test to prove my vaccine did its job? Darian? <laughs> I do Taste not this. like antibody tests. I nor <laughs> I do think I. That, <laughs> I think that we fall on the same page on this. Um, antibody testing, although I think can be interesting, isn't clinically that helpful um, because it can sometimes be nonspecific and also variable in terms of the result. And so antibody testing is one of those things where I personally have not gotten it. Um, and I think, again, if you think it's interesting, you can get it. But I don't think that there is much um, helpfulness to it, to the result of an antibody test. And also what's very important for people to understand, because we heard so much about those antibody tests pretty early on in the pandemic. Um, by early on, I mean a year ago now. It's crazy <laughs> to say that. But um, the, the one of the most commonly used assays or tests to detect COVID or SARS-CoV-2 antibodies looks for a certain type of the spike protein, 
but others to measure your titers after vaccine may look at a different protein. So you're not even necessarily using the right test to look at the right protein. And that's why uh, those results can be very misleading. They can be inconsistent. And um, really, that is not the purpose of antibody testing. Um, for clinical trials, yes, they're obviously following what we call titers, which is just how high the antibody levels you have in your body are. But for the general public, uh, absolutely not recommended at this time. I have not done it. So there you go, two, two doctors, an N of two. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there you have it. Um, next question from Evelyn in Jersey City, New Jersey. Evelyn asks, my mom is 67 years old. She got her first dose of Pfizer on February 17th, but missed her second dose, which was scheduled for March 10th. As of today, she has not received the second dose. Can she still get the second dose after two or more months from the first one? Kelly, you must get this question all the time. Yes, we do get it pretty frequent. And no, it's never too late to get your second dose. So there is a such thing as getting a, your second dose too early, but I would encourage her to tell her mother, go ahead and get that second dose. Um, and Rachel, is there anything that you've heard from um, teenagers who are starting to become, you know, depending on their age, 16, 17, 18, um, do they have any unique concerns about this vaccine? That's such an interesting question. I, I, the only, and I don't have a very large sample size of this, but for those that have been um, mentioning it, they seem excited and, and happy that they're being included in sort of the group that can be vaccinated. So I actually haven't heard a whole lot of vaccination anxiety, um, more just, you know, I think, I think our teenagers are so well informed about so many things. So um, I, I think mostly just excitement and curiosity around just being able to have access to, to the vaccination. Um, good point, and I share that excitement <laughs> personally. <laughs> um, next question comes from Wendy in Glenhead, and she asks, have you seen or heard of issues where people with autoimmune illnesses are having flare-ups? Um, so many people with rheumatologic disorders or conditions um, concerned about getting the vaccine, not getting the vaccine, and getting COVID. Um, Darian, what's your take on this? I get this question so often, especially in the emergency room. Um, and you know, I wasn't anticipating it when we started to roll this vaccine out. And what I give that, I give the same advice often to everyone, which is that right now we have not seen any safety signals that make us uh, have any increased suspicion or concern that those who have a history of a prior immune condition would be at risk for a flare up. Um, but of course this is evolving. And thankfully because of the transparency of the system and safety, if there were any signals, we would be aware of them. Um, and Kelly, what what can you tell me about um, it, tangentially related safety concerns um, in in different racial and ethnic populations? Columbia, which is my alma mater as well, <laughs> um, such a melting pot um, with people from all parts of the world um, living there. Anything that that you've seen that really jumps out at you? Yeah, I I just want people to know that when they did the the research trials, they did test this vaccine among people from all different ethnicities, races, people with underlying conditions. So we're finding that those results that are published, the effectiveness of the vaccine is really for everyone. It's across the board. Um, so, you know, I know that there's a lot of, you know, hesitancy, particularly um, among communities of color, um, about the side effects, about has it been studied on us. And even the trials, again, they had a variety of people that were the trials uh, were done on. So I think I feel with some confidence that, you know, these vaccines work, whether you're black, Latino, um, if you have underlying conditions that people have, we have that evidence to prove that it is effective. And, um, you know, we definitely encourage people from all different races, ethnicities to get the vaccine. And have you been encouraged by what you've seen in terms of uh, people of color getting vaccinated? We're definitely seeing an increase in people of color getting vaccinated. You know, in the media, there was a lot about there was this hesitancy in the black community. But I think a lot of it is, um, you know, some people just wanted to wait and see. You know, they were on the fence. And so now that we have so many people that received the vaccine and we can see that they're doing fine, I think more and more people are starting to get vaccinated. And some of it has nothing to do, you know, 
there is some hesitancy because of the medical atrocities that have happened. You know, we all know the Tuskegee uh, experiment, but also is access to the vaccine. In some of these communities of color, it's, you know, the vaccine clinics are open nine to five and people can't take off from work to get there. We don't have the vaccine clinics in some certain neighborhoods. Um, so it's not just hesitancy, but it's also access to the vaccine that has been a challenge among communities of color. And in many cases also transportation, you mentioned time, but transportation and Absolutely. technology, um, a lot of times people have to sign up online and certainly, um, again, not to make sweeping generalizations, but certainly some older individuals um, mm -hmm. might be more homebound, might be more insular in terms of uh, their tech comfort level. And by the way, that crosses color lines. I can tell you, um, not to mention anyone, my parents uh, have a hard time <laughs> using computers. <laughs> um, but Darian, what uh, you mentioned both your grandmas are vaccinated. Um, did they did they recruit you to speak to some of their <laughs> friends or um, you know, in, in, their, in their churches? Or how did that go? You know, absolutely. I have one grandma who got the vaccine almost as near when I got the vaccine, as early on as possible. And my second grandmother took a long time to deliberate um, as she is someone that really wanted to know the facts and the specifics while, while my other grandma said, just vaccinate me, I want to be safe. Um, and I think that it was really interesting to have that experience because dealing with both of their questions, one who really didn't have any, and then my, my, my grandmother who really had a lot, it really helped me to understand the perspective of patients who are looking at this from an outside perspective. And absolutely, um, I joined with not only my family education as I have a large family, but the communities that my grandmothers live in. One of my grandmothers lives in Westchester and my other grandmother lives in Harlem. And she was someone who took a long time to, look, to deliberate and so it definitely required my time to answer and address a lot of questions. And I felt that most of the questions were really around safety um, and people wanted to know the data. And it, I realized at that moment in time, it wasn't as accessible and um, uh, understandable as I, as I thought it would be um, because of my own preconceived education and knowledge. I, I forget sometimes that some, some information is honestly just not easily understood. And Rachel, you know, when you talk about, I, I wish that the term vaccine hesitancy, I wish we could find another name for it. Um, because again, I, I'm kind of a glasses half full type of person and I prefer to refer to it as, you know, appropriate questioning, um, which I think is always a good thing in medicine, especially when you're talking about doing something uh, on or in your body. So if you were in charge, let's say, or par part of the White House coronavirus uh, group, how would you address what is going on right now in the country? Because it seems like a lot of people who were for the vaccine, you know, have been aggressive about signing up. You know, as we know, over 100 million Americans have gotten at least one dose. What about the other 200 million Americans who may still be concerned? How would you address that from a psychological standpoint? Um. It, this is a tough one, but I, I think what I think it goes really nicely with what Dr. Darren is saying about his grandmothers, right? So the people who are like, sign me up, that you, that's an audience you like, they're already sold, right? I think part of it from a psychological perspective is understanding each person and, and what's getting in the way of them making that decision. So is it that the information is not, it's high level technical information that needs to be delivered in a way that's just understandable and digestible? Or is it that there are fears or anxieties? And if so, about what? So I often will say to people, what's getting in the way of you making this decision? Or what further information do you feel you need to know? And I think that sometimes can get at what, where are the sticking points? Um, if it's someone saying, I don't have enough information and the data, then giving data about not only the risks and benefits of getting the vaccine, but what you said, Dr. Jen, from the very beginning, the risks associated with getting COVID if you're not vaccinated are so high, right? So if you're thinking only about the vaccine and you're not thinking about the other piece, you need, and sometimes drawing it out. So maybe you need a, a graphic because too much talking is, is stressful. Too much language on someone's brain when they're in a stressful situation isn't helpful or saying like, what's getting in the way of you making this decision? What else can I tell you? And then also saying, I hear you, this is this is scary. If this were an easy decision or if this were an easy time, it wouldn't be called a pandemic, right? So just validating, this is hard. I, I get it, 
and then really having that empathy and compassion to help people kind of move along depending on where in the process of change they are. That's so helpful. Um, Isabel, I want to... Second, Dr. Jen? Yes. I yes. was, I was, all of that, when you were just saying that, so rang true to me. I consider myself a pretty smart person with a lot of access to a lot of information, yet and still, because of my allergies, because of my background, when I heard about a vaccine, I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, and so that was real. And, and then having my reaction after the first, I, there was even a point where I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get the seven, second dose. But right. talk to people, talk to Dr. Jen, talk to your doctors, acknowledge this is scary. And right. then, you know, the second one, the, the folks at the hospital were terrific. I let them know, as you all said to do. And it was, it was, um, yeah, acknowledging that and doing yeah. it. You need to be, if I could just say, you need to be validated, right? Because if you just, if someone comes in and say, says, I have a history of allergies, or I have, um, you know, an autoimmune disorder, and someone sort of says, "Oh, it'll be fine." That 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 dismissiveness or the, is so invalidating, and that's likely going to make someone who is already hesitant be like, "Well, you're not you're not actually hearing. You're just saying it's fine," and I don't know if it's fine. Yeah. So the person needs to say, "Well, Kimberly, yeah, of course you would be worried. That makes perfect sense to me. I, that makes sense." Or like, if Dr. Jen carries an EpiPen, that's a really smart thing to do. She should be prepared even though she probably won't need to use it. So I think you need people to say, of course, this is hard. And Isabel, yeah, is, is, we're going to get through it, though. It, that's so, so true, um, Rachel. And Isabel, you, um, some of your centers are in Chinatown. Obviously, um, Asian hate crimes have been national news, unfortunately, for the last several weeks. Um, we've just talked about concern or fear or anxiety with getting the vaccine for medical reasons, but are you seeing concern and fear and anxiety of people um, of Asian descent to even go out and wait online at a vaccination center now? Um, that's a really good question because in the beginning, it was all about where do I find the vaccination? How do I get access to it? Everyone was very um, excited to go get vaccinated for those who were uh, wanting to find vaccinations. I think in the last three weeks, um, what we're noticing is that our seniors, particularly our seniors, have um, been very concerned about uh, getting vaccinations because they don't want to leave their homes. They're afraid of being attacked. Um, that's why, you know, uh, some of the community-based organizations like us, uh, Settlement Houses, is the best place to contact because this is where most of our seniors, our children, our, our adults, uh, clients have built a rapport, a, a connection, a trust. Uh, so we try to explain to them that we will try to provide transportation. Um, it could be someone escorting them, someone there could be a language to help them with the process. Um, but we have, I, I will honestly tell you, we have seen seniors who have um, actually have decided not to go out and get the vaccinations in the last three weeks. Mm. That is unbelievable. Um, and, and you bring up a really, really powerful reminder, such an act of good um, for people who maybe have already been vaccinated to offer to take a friend or a neighbor um, just to escort them. That can be truly life-saving. Um, we're getting so many great questions. I want to get to another one from Linda in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Linda asks, is there any data on people breaking out in shingles after receiving the COVID vaccine? I received my second Pfizer vaccine on March 4th and one month later broke out with shingles. Darian? No, there is no data or safety signals that show that you have an increased risk of a shingles outbreak secondary to the vaccine. And this is where it kind of comes into play where we talk about the natural presence of something versus a vaccine association. I think oftentimes we want to pick that association or, or the cause and effect because it makes sense. But we often forget that sometimes these things just simply happen. And so I think that this might be more of that case. Um, but of course, we're continuing to watch and be mindful for any possibility of any adverse outcomes such as this. I would also just add like in the, again, I'm not a physician, but in the medical, in the psychological world, we, we as humans are amazing. We have these brains that can think and create and do amazing things, but we do look for associations and we look for things to make sense. And sometimes they do, like you knock something off your desk and it immediately falls. That's pretty much gravity, but also <laughs> cause and effect. But when you have these two events 
and and we try to we of course try to link things. We that's how we make sense of the world. But that's why we look to Dr. Darian or other medical professionals to actually tell us like I of course you're trying to link these dots, but this might actually be coincidence because all kinds of things happen all the time. And right now we're very attuned to our bodies, for sure. We're in what's called vigilance and we're in a hypervigilance. And so we are going to be on alert for anything and then desperately try to link those things together, which is great that we try to do that high level thinking, but sometimes it can be misleading. And another thing, you know, Darian mentioned um, these real life events, another way of referring to that, which people may hear um, when they listen to epidemiologists and public health officials talk about these um, associated events is something called background rates. So, you know, um, let's take clotting, which is again in the store, in the news uh, this week, was in the news several weeks ago um, occurring in Europe. Every single year in the United States, 300,000 to 600,000 Americans have what's called a deep vein thrombosis, a blood clot in their leg, a pulmonary embolism, blood clot in their lung. My own daughter happened to have one last year unrelated to COVID. Um, and then when you take that population, those things that happen every single day, and by the way, you can, you can substitute different numbers for heart attacks, seizures, stroke, you know, sudden death, et cetera, et cetera. You can go all the way down the long list we have in medicine. Then if you put that on top of the three to four million Americans in this country who are getting vaccinated every day, you will wind up with, unfortunately, a certain number of people who are vaccinated and experience X. So if you're talking about a blood clot, for example, 10 to 20 people every single day at the current vaccination rate will experience a blood clot having nothing to do with that vaccine. It's just an overlap. So until in science and medicine, we can establish causality, cause and effect, a mechanism to explain that. And unless we see a rate that exceeds that of the background rate, um, that is something that we just have to realize goes on all the time. And it just happens to be happening in people who are vaccinated. Darren, do you think that's... Uh, a good way of, of thinking about it? Absolutely. And um, like I try to tell patients when I diagnose them with new blood clots or even shingles, um, and they want to draw that association, maybe it was because I recently got the vaccine. And then I'll often say, you know, I've been diagnosing this before COVID existed. Um, and I think that sometimes that's right. a little bit more helpful to draw that picture of these things often just happen naturally in life. Exactly. Um, next question we just got from Siobhan in Brooklyn. Siobhan asks, I received the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. 10 days later, I had slight neck pain and noticed I had a left supraclavicular lymph node swelling. So that's right above the collarbone here. Should I be worried and should I get the second shot in a few weeks in the same arm or opposite side of the original injection? Kelly, have you heard this question from any of your patients? We've actually seen some people that we've, um, their lymph nodes get enlarged. And that, again, is the body's reaction to the vaccine. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's building antibodies. So it's not uncommon um, to have some, some swelling. However, I always tell people, if you have any concerns, anything, go see your health care provider. Um, if there's no harm in getting it checked out um, because we don't want to see people getting these symptoms and then foregoing getting that second dose. Uh, so that would be my advice. If she's concerned, definitely go and talk to your health care provider. Agree. Um, and uh, boy, I get this question literally every day. Can the vaccine affect fertility? So let's go back for some historical uh, perspective here. This was literally a rumor uh, that spread like wildfire around the world, largely on social media around December when the first vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, received FDA emergency use authorization. Um, right now, and I have been in touch with the head of ACOG, the OBGYN organization in the United States, Dr. Fauci, the former FDA commissioner, the new CDC director about this. Um, we have zero evidence that there is any untoward effect or safety concern with respect to fertility and these COVID-19 vaccines. What we do know is that in general, vaccines have an incredibly safe track record during pregnancy. 
um, and that a lot of times a pregnant woman, depending on the vaccine that she gets, can transfer some antibody protection, some immune protection to the fetus, which obviously uh, is kind of a two for one, protecting two lives uh, with one vaccination administration. But right now, um, even women who are not pregnant are asking, could this affect my fertility down the road? Um, the way these vaccines work, there is not even a plausible suggestion of a mechanism to, to suggest that this could affect future fertility. And remember what we are seeing with pregnant women getting infected with COVID, with some women enrolled in the clinical trials who inadvertently became pregnant, and now pregnant women being formally recruited and enrolled and studied in clinical trials, we have not seen any increase in miscarriage, stillbirth, any impact on fertility at this time. So based on the available data, this is a myth. Um, and I will just add, button this up with the fact that my daughter who's 21 uh, has been vaccinated through her uh, year off from college job. So um, I had no concerns about her future fertility with respect to that. Um, what about going back to school? And what do we need to know in terms of um, certain anxieties, concerns, stresses on the part of teenagers and children, but also their families and the teachers and staff working in that school. Rachel, can you address that? Yeah, I think we're we're seeing and we're seeing some changes, right? Even just in the last couple of weeks. Like I know my sister's kids have just started to have their first day of in-person school, you know, after coming off a hybrid schedule. And so I think we want to remember that on one hand, kids are really resilient. And I think kids have been amazing during this time and they follow our lead. So they follow what we model and we want what we say to align with our behaviors. We wanna act calm, even if we don't feel calm. Mm. But I think it's important to remember that going back to our example of getting back out in the world, we need to give our kids and teenagers practice, right? So I know I went to my office in Manhattan and hadn't been there in a long time. And after two days, I was like, wow, I am really, really exhausted. I'm really tired, I'm out of the practice of commuting. And so remembering this is new, behaviors that we haven't been engaging in in a while. So we need to be patient, we need to be encouraging, and we need to remember that even though we as parents might be like, go back to school, we're so excited. We need to remember that each kid, some might be excited, some might be a little nervous. And if we don't ask, we want to ask a question like, so, you know, Kelly, how are you feeling about going back to school? Rather than, are you nervous about X? Because if you leave it open-ended, then your child will tell you, right? So they might be like, I'm worried about my math times tables because I haven't practiced those in a while. And you weren't even thinking that. You were thinking they're worried about the masks or who am I going to sit with at lunch because I don't know if there's going to be plexiglass barriers. But if you didn't say, well, what do you think about it? Which is very open, then you won't get the information. So I think be open, be curious, and then praise just getting out there and being brave about little step by step. Um, Rachel, uh, another question that I actually have for you. Um, sure. You know, we have a saying in medicine, pediatrics, uh, kids are not small adults, right? That's why there are specialists like yourself right. uh, who deal with this age group. But it's not one size fits all, even within the child and the adolescent popula uh, population. So can you just quickly tease through for us you know, let's say elementary school age children versus middle school age children versus older yeah. teenagers and what might be age appropriate for them? Absolutely. I think you're right. We're, we don't just have small adults, right? So let's start with teenagers. Teenagers know a lot. They're on social media quite a bit and they probably know more than we think they do and maybe more than us. So I think with a teenager, it's helpful to say, you know, like Kimberly, school, you know, school's open again. What do you already know? So you, you want to gauge what they know, then you can correct any misinformation or say, wow, actually, Isabel, that's a pretty high level understanding of what's going on. What questions do you have for me? And if your teen is like, I don't have any, great, but just know I am here if you have any. I think then with middle school, we might do the same, but just give a little bit more fact-based information. Like, so on Monday, you're going to be going back to school five days in person rather than what you were doing before. Um, here's the teacher you're gonna be with, it's the same teacher as before. Or it's gonna be a change because 
Ms. Smith is working from home, but Mr. Jones is working at the school. What do you want to know? What are you thinking about? Right. And then same. And you want to answer if a kid asks a question, they're old enough to get an answer. We don't want to use myths and metaphors. Those are very confusing for people. And then I think with younger kids, let's say like eight and below, or again, say if you can say it in a couple of sentences, that's best. Long dialogues lose your child. So you're going back to school on Monday and sort of lay it out as a social story. You're going to get on the bus or I'm going to drive you. And you're going to go. And then at the end of the day, I'll pick you up. What? Any questions? That's really helpful. But you still are giving information, checking in to make sure you have understanding. And then, you know, always being available to correct misinformation. And, you know, we talk so much about children in the set setting of going back to school, um, but obviously schools don't run themselves, so there are grown-ups who work in those schools. Um, does anyone want to talk about the concerns, either health or emotional or psychological or logistical, of the staff, the teachers, the faculty, the people who work in schools who may have their own anxiety or, or real questions um, in returning to the classroom also? I think I'd just add, and of course, I want to hear what other people have to say, is that, again, leading with compassion is really helpful, right? So we as a par parents or we as the parents of our kids, you know, we want them back in school or we want what's in our mind, right, or on, on foremost in our mind. But our educators have been working so hard, right, to, also, to educate but also balance the needs of their family. So it's always helpful to lead from a place of empathy and lead from a place of like, I might be asking for something, but it'd be really helpful to remember all of these educators, the staff, facilities, IT, everything, administrators are also working really hard and they're people managing their own anxieties and fears and worries. So that's helpful to remember, like we are all going through this together. Cause like what you said, everyone in, in education also has similar worries or concerns. And well, so I just want to say running a child care centers in, um, in our organizations, um, they've been open throughout the pandemic. And you're right, um, uh, Dr. Rachel, that it's been very hard. We, we tried to be very um, understandable. And I think the staggering of schedules and making sure everyone is safe is very important, not only for the children, but the parents and the teachers. It's really utmost, um, making the environment most safe and comfortable and listening to them and making sure you report all of those kinds of uh, exposures and making sure you're following up with the, with the Department of Health, and that's really critical. Um, it's hard to believe, but we just have about two minutes left. I want to give um, Darian and Kelly also kind of a chance to, to share some final thoughts about anything. It doesn't have to be going <laughs> back to school, but you guys are really on the front lines. Um, Kelly, why don't you go first? I did want to add to the, the last question. I would say one thing that we found that was very helpful is to have town halls like we're having right here. We had these small intimate town halls with our staff, students, uh, faculty, where you know we did give some information about the vaccine and other things, but also giving them an opportunity to ask those questions, to talk about what is it gonna be like when you return back to work? What is the cleaning policy gonna be? How are we protecting everyone? I think having being transparent and having those conversations and allowing people to ask those questions that, you know, that are on their mind is a great way of that should be done before people start coming back to whether it's school, university setting. And Darian, um, emergency room, you've been really in the trenches um, throughout this whole pandemic. What are your final thoughts? What are you thinking of now? I think that this is just a time of stressful information coming at us in all different directions. So if I can give any, um, uh, uh, any, any kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If I can give, uh, if I can give any kind of advice, I would simply say, read beyond the headlines and checking validated resources. And understand that from my perspective as an emergency physician in the ER, these vaccines truly are working. They are decreasing rates of admissions, hospitalizations, and deaths as we see it day to day. Yeah. And I just want to uh, advise people that, that, is, that it is a true benefit and it gives me a lot of hope. And I, I can't wait to see where we go from here. Well, thank you all of you um, for sharing your expertise with us this afternoon. And, and again, I want to encourage encourage people to really proceed based on facts and not fear. We're all tired. We're all frustrated. We're all learning every day, but we will get through it together. Um, and thank you 
for watching us and joining us this afternoon. You can find a vaccination site near you with ABC7 NY's COVID-19 tracker. I'm Dr. Jennifer Ashton with ABC News. Thanks for joining us.